embracing and loving God of so many names. We thank you once again for bringing us together this morning. Be with each of us now as we share the true spirit of Christ that is in each of us. Let us be that gift to one another through your guidance, while at the same time opening our hearts this morning, but evermore opening our minds so that we may be the receptors of the words that are about to be spoken. I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay and mold them into the words that need to be spoken on this morning, and the words that come from my mouth and the meditations that come from each and every one of our hearts. Let them ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So now that you've heard the first portion of Ruth, all, whatever, chapter one, believe me, there's three more chapters. Um, good morning. <laughs> I welcome you for the first time, if it's your first time in the new year. The new year. It's your first Sunday in church. So is anybody out there make resolutions? Does anybody make resolutions at the start of the new year? Yes. Okay, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of, then all the rest of you have got it all figured out then. So if none of you have any resolutions for this next year, you're either all fooling us, or you just don't want to admit that you're making a resolution each time there's a new year. So I'm going to help you out a little here. I'm going to suggest to you five things that are apparently the most common resolutions for 2019 for all those weird people out there who recognize but they're not perfect. <laughs> Thankfully, that some of us don't need that because you know we're all perfect and you know we're all here. So starting with number five, some people, not us, <laughs> want to learn something new, learn a new skill. But of course, we don't need that because we've got life all figured out, right? <laughs> some people, the fourth one, want to make a new friend. But of course, you all don't need that because your lives are all complete, right? Moving on to number three, which seems to be one of my favorites because some people want to read more. And the reason I'm claiming this to be one of my favorites is because if you go on social media, that one seems to be the most popular one of people saying, I need some good books to read. Well, get yourself off social media and find a few books to read. <laughs> and start reading. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you that reading everybody's posts on social media doesn't count. <laughs> you know. Number two on the list. Increase self-care. A.K.A. sleep more. And let me tell you, that goes high on my list because as many of you know, I get up early in the morning, like 5 a.m., early and I go to the gym and it just happened that sometimes you just look at yourself in the mirror when you're in the gym and you go, oh my, is that what I look like at 5 o'clock in the morning? Oh my, more sleep, baby. And don't get me wrong, you all look cool to sleep. Looks like everybody had a good night's sleep last night. You know? And coming in at first place, there was a three-way tie. The first one was to save more money, which I was fascinated by because it didn't say make more money. And I'm taking that maybe that we have more than we realize. Eat healthier and exercise more. But again, none of us need that because we're all perfect, right? But I'm going to suggest to you today a resolution that we're not going to find on any of our online resources. Maybe something we've never had thought of before. A resolution that might even have potential to really be powerful in 2019 and evidently identify us as a kind of church that Jesus may have had in mind. Basically, Jesus would define it as kicking in all the gates of hell, and I hope you join me on, on board with that as we do that this year. We're going to get into that resolution a little later, so we're going to begin by exploring the life of Naomi. As we heard in Scripture this morning, we heard it through the eyes of Ruth. And you're probably thinking that since we're reading from the book of Ruth, we should be speaking of Ruth. Well, 
when you get to preach one day and stand up here, you can preach for whoever you want to preach on. <laughs> but we're going to deal with Ruth this morning. It's one of those kinds of kinds of deals that the opening chapter of Ruth, the opening <coughs> chapter of Ruth, chapter one, in the days when the judges ruled. Now. We can just breeze through that, and okay, there are some judges, whoever and whomever they are in the Bible, but the thing you need to know about the judges, that the judges were informal leaders. And it's not an official government role, it's not one of those official leadership roles, so think about the wild, wild west, and then multiply that number to a really big number, and... That's what you get all the time of Judges. So what's going on during the time of Judges would make the wild, wild west look somewhat blah. Make it look tame and the people would say, they did what? Really? Yep, I guess the wild west was blah. It was violent, it was chaotic, it was unruly. The book of Judges literally ends by saying, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Basically saying, yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> it was that kind of world back then. So, in that kind of world, what we have is really harsh reality where things were violent and chaotic and self-serving. <coughs> there was no kind of centralized care for people. And here we are introduced to Elimelech and Naomi, from whose life got much worse and harder. You see, on top of all the chaos of the time that the judges ruled, there was a famine, a bad famine. Not just their normal famine, but it was a bad famine enough that it was super violent and super chaotic, and everything else, at that point, should have been, don't venture outside your homeland. It was so bad and so destitute that the unknown looks better <laughs> than the status quo. So, I'm kind of curious. Has 2019 gotten off to a start like that for you? Or was 2018 like nothing else you've seen before? And I mean, was that better? You know, it's a powerful place to be because while it might seem hopeless in our lives sometimes, look at what they do. The land is crazy. There's violence everywhere. Nothing is normalized or centralized. It's kind of every person for themselves. And this famine hits. And here Elimelech and Naomi say, you know what? We know it's scary. We know that there's unsurety out there, but we're going to face it out there, and it's going to be better, and let's go. I'm like, okay. Well, let me tell you something. That's called hope. When you're willing to pay back or pack up and just say, hey, let's give it a try. Let's go. That's called hope, because if you have no hope, and if Elimelech and Naomi were like, just, A, or hopeless, nothing would happen. They would just stay, they would just leave, they wouldn't move, they would just stay and squeak it out the best they could. That's not hope. But they had this belief that even though they didn't understand what was going on out there, and what was out there, it's got to be better, right? So now know, now know that the word Naomi means pleasant. So if you get the sense that this hope and this pleasantry that all these kind of people in the world are like our oysters, then you have that hope of finding the pearl. So they had this attitude that they were going to make it work, and that this next year that we're going to make lives for ourselves work and happen this year. But we all know <coughs> that life doesn't work that way. That we all know that Naomi is going to figure out just how difficult life can be because Emelette died. 
leaving Naomi in this foreign land, apart from her family and friends, amongst the sea of strangers, nonetheless, was not just one, but two daughters-in-law. Now, Naomi is bitter, she's bruised, she's disillusioned, she's alone, and while at the same time, she's surrounded by conflict. Something that none of us know about, right? <laughs> but, you have to understand, back in the day, you needed a guy in your life. Now, not that we wouldn't need one right now, but back then, sadly, women were dependent on the men. <coughs> you see that back in the day she would have turned to Elimelech, but he died. And then she would have turned to her sons, but they died as well. So who does she turn to? Oh wait, there's nobody left. So in their culture, to be without a man is in that context a woman here now with just two daughter-in-laws. So now she's scared, she's hurt, and what do people usually do when that happens, when they're scared or hurt or something's not going just their way? They push people away. And what does she do? She pulls her daughters-in-law and she tells them that, I have nothing for you. Go back to your family and I'm going to go do whatever's left with my family, and she tells them to go. <coughs> now, Orpha, not Oprah, Orpha. So many people get that confused. So Oprah, no. So Orpha gives Naomi a kiss and goes back to her family. So you have to see through this. Ruth has this sense now in her that somebody is walking away or leaves you. That means something more than anything that you probably need that person even more. And what do we do as individuals when we have conflict or hurt and that negative? Again, we push people away and we run for the hills. How often have we had these things going on in our lives? We don't reach out to people that we love, our friends, our family, those who are there to support us, but we run for the hills. So I'm going to invite you this week to maybe take a moment in your life to reach out to that person in your life that maybe when you were in that rut or that quandary that you didn't reach out and say, hey, thanks for being in my life. Thanks for being supportive. Even if that person isn't with you anymore or isn't with us, period, take that minute and just say, hey, thanks. We need to say thanks to those people who are even in the thick of our troubles and our quandaries and always to that moment, reach out and make sure that we're going to be okay. Now back to the story. Naomi and Ruth go back to their hometown, and as they arrive, they're greeted by the hometown folk, because you know, in those small towns, like Milwaukee, mm -hmm. everybody knows everybody, and knows everything about everybody, and all that kind of good stuff. So as they arrive, they're greeted by everybody, saying, hey, we're so glad you're back, Great to see you, Ruth and Naomi. We missed you. Welcome back. What can we do? And by calling that name, Naomi says, Don't call me Naomi. And don't call me pleasant. Just call me bitter. I was going to say bitter old queen, but... You know. <laughs> that life stinks and that, you know, I don't need anything from God right now. Huh. So good to see you too, Naomi, right? <laughs> nice to see you. So make Naomi, Naomi really makes it hard for anyone to be around her. Now I'm going to make another appeal to you that, that if there is someone that is difficult in your life right now, or someone you really don't think you can be around, realize it's not all about them. Be like Ruth, who didn't give up on Naomi and reached out and was there so you should be there for them. Realize that where Naomi's resolution kicks in, it's this opportunity to do over. It kicks in, and then something wonderful happens. Take the time to read the rest of Naomi this week. It's only three more chapters. Now, 
to read Ruth, not Naomi, I mean, to read Ruth this week. It's only three more chapters. Ruth is only four chapters long. You already heard the first one. <laughs> the other three aren't as long. Okay. Yeah, remember, read more this year. That was one of those resolutions. <laughs> but this incredible thing happens. Ruth, the new girl in town, new girl in the area, she's out in those fields doing what she's doing. She's picking the barley and she comes across this guy. And this guy comes up to Naomi and says, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> it wasn't one of my best Brooklyn accents, but okay. And Ruth is like, huh? Like, well, hey, you're talking to me? So Ruth is not used to these customs that go around and goes back to Naomi and tells her, I'm out there getting the crop and this guy comes up and says, hey, how you doing? And Naomi is like, well, what the... Now Naomi is, all of a sudden, she comes alive and she begins to share her experience. She begins to start investing in Ruth coaching her and mentoring her and begins to pour her life out to Ruth. And here all of a sudden that bitter old queen, that crotchety Naomi, who wanted to do nothing more, comes alive. This, no, Naomi, I kept that word out all of a sudden, Naomi, Naomi discovers her do-over. And she begins to engage in Ruth, helping Ruth find hers. You know, maybe, just maybe, our resolution this year is less me, 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 I, 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 mine, mine, mine. And maybe it's less about that and more along coming aside someone and helping them discover their do-over or their life as we discover ours. Maybe it's taking time to go out in our community, helping those who need help. It's maybe, maybe it's even next weekend, and you'll hear more about it later, is taking the Saturday and signing up and going and helping the folks at Courage House as they get it painted and get it ready for February when they open and they'll be able to house and work with our homeless LGBT kids. Maybe it's taking time to just go visit someone who's elderly and needs some help getting groceries or whatever. They're just suggestions. But who's to say that in 2019, as a church, we make it more or less about us and more about the others in our lives by helping others discover theirs. So now fast forwarding a little bit, because I know that I've already probably rambled on longer than I should have, but now here's Ruth married with a child. Naomi is now holding her grandson, bouncing him on her knee, and here all those women that gathered with them before when they came to town and who said, hey Naomi, back way back in the when, are now saying, hey Naomi, look, God has given you a do-over. You have another man in the family, a grandson. Look, look what God has done for you. So now there's a bigger part to all the story because God has now brought all of us together allowing us to have this do-over in our lives. You see, Ruth discovers that she's able now to hold her grandson, that second chance to have that do-over, all because she invested her life in Ruth. And what Ruth and Naomi didn't know as they were holding this son and this baby in their arms, this little baby Obed, that Obed becomes the father of Jesse, and Jesse becomes the father of David, King David, the greatest king that Israel will ever experience in their lives, has now set up the total lineage for Jesus. Go back and read your Old Testament Bible. <laughs> the only literally got that help to hope, literally got the help in the hope that the world, that she began to coach and mentor Ruth because it was all part of God's plan. All to do this for the biggest do-over that the world would ever witness down the road. That witness that we'll all get to experience just in a few moments as we come to the table for communion. Remembering that the big, biggest do-over that ever God ever gave us was Jesus the Christ. So as we enter 2019, 
I invite you to be a little bit like Naomi, the nice Naomi, and allow yourself that do-over that comes into your life for 2019. Amen? Amen. <coughs>